of you a little bit about things, sorry, is a little bit about when we look back at the Duluth model, it's been 45 years now, for, going on 45 years since it started, 1978, is what are we still doing? What do we make mistakes on? What do we change? What's new and kind of what's emerging from a global perspective? The first thing just to say is that the Duluth model is not a perpetrated program. So most people think it's a perpetrated program, it's not. It's an organizing um, methodology, and in the central tenet of it, also related to what Sonia was saying, we got to meet with Sonia and her colleagues on Monday, um, is that the voices of survivors are included in everything we do, right? So I am aware of the advisory council, like the sort of, you know, I know there is like in Victoria, we were just there last week, that there is a survivor's advisory council, a lot of consultation, but for us, it's, we have this firm commitment in Duluth, and we talk about the Duluth model, that we don't do anything or make any changes unless survivors have included their input, okay? So just even at a small level, so I'm just gonna take this uh, piece, of, imagine this is blue, it's not, I know it's yellow, but imagine this is blue for a second. So even for us, so when we sit around at our tables in Duluth, and. One of the things we wanted our police to do was we wanted our police to give out um, a piece of paper that had information about all the services that were available to survivors. So whether they made arrests or anything, so we said, well, let's make a form. So we is the blue, and uh, so let's sit around together and we're all, we all think we're really smart and put all this information down. And so we did, and then we had, um, a group of survivors that we got together. We, by the way, we pay all of our survivors. We don't use the same survivors, you know, every time. It's a random group. But this group, we wanted survivors who had had contact with the police in the last two years. So we made this tri-folded, two-sided thing. We gave it to all the survivors and said, this is what it's for. We want your input on what we're doing. And so we gave it to them. And the, um, one of the first women who got her, she looked at, she said, I throw it away. And he said, well, we're quite offended by that. <laughs> We've spent a lot of time on this, <laughs> you know? And um, could you have a little more respect, please, for all the work? No, we didn't say that, but you know, it's like one of those things. But we were really committed, right, to not get offended, to not say you're wrong, right? And then all the other women said the same thing, right? And so what they said to us, and their feedback, of course, was instrumental, was that for us, they just said, you have, you're, oh, we get why you have all this on here. It's way too much information. The type is way too small. First of all, it's two-sided. No, right, that I want something small. Like, what are the key things? Let's have a conversation then about what are the key things I need to know at that moment. One woman said, I had just been strangled, right? And you think I'm gonna read? No, I'm not going to. So I need to have something that I can maybe hide in my wallet, my purse or wherever for the, I can take a photo of it so it's on my phone in a safe space. It's just way too much, right? So as an example, and I know a lot of, um, there's been a lot of consultations with survivors here, but one of the things that we sort of say about this is that it's integral to our work, right? We just don't do anything because we um, are just, we're, we're co-leaders with survivors. So uh, the other piece of it for us is that in terms of it, in order to be a Duluth model sort of um, response, that uh, women's organizations have to co-lead the integrated response. So we would say here, like if I saw an integrated response, and I, one of my questions, they say, well, we're doing the Duluth model. I have a few key questions for you. Are women's organizations co-leading it, yes or no? And if they say no, they say, well, you're not really doing the Duluth model. We can talk with you about that, right? Because we want to have practitioners who are most closely tied to survivors' voices at the center. And then how much do you include survivors' voices? I was telling Sonia and others, too, one of the, um, we are in Victoria last week, is one of the things that um, UN Women wanted us to do is a lot of places said, well, that they don't engage survivors in the same way that we do for two reasons. They said, one, we think it can be re-traumatizing to survivors, and then two, we don't know all the steps 
to do it, right? Like, I need some help. Do you have, like, some practical forms and those sorts of things? So um, the Australian government is actually the one that funded us to do this. So we actually just re released a guide. You can find it online. Um, but it's called Safe Consultations with um, Violence Against Women and Girls. So we did this. And one of the big things I just want to say is most of our focus groups and interviews with survivors, they don't talk about any of the violence they experienced. Right? So there's often kind of this assumption that survivors have to talk about what they are experience, and they don't. Now, there are cases where you may want them to, right? I'm not saying they're not, and I'm not saying there are cases where survivors won't just bring it up. They will, right? But this presumption they have to is a myth, I would say. So like when we did that blue form, we didn't, not one survivor, you know, that one woman said, you know, I've been just been strangled, but we, she didn't have to go through all of that sort of stuff, right? She was giving context for her life, okay? So the other thing we do is that we pay women's organizations. So every time either, so we have three in Duluth um, organizations that work with survivors. Every time our integrated response works with one of them, we give the organization $2,500 because of the time that they put into helping organize the focus group. Sometimes they do it with us. And then survivors get um, 50 US dollars. I know right now in Australia, that's a lot of money. Our money's going a long way here right now. <laughs> so I'm aware about the, the, the difference in the cost from when we were here five years ago. Um, but just kind of know when we sort of say, how do we centralize survivors? That's what we need, okay? The other thing about being an, um, an organizing sort of method is that None of our criminal justice partners, so prosecutors, probation, uh, women's organizations, shelters, um, we've all made this firm commitment that none of us make a change in any of our practices related to domestic violence or sexual violence without um, coordinating that with others. Okay? So the police can't do it. They can't make any changes in their domestic and sexual violence unless it's gone before all of us. Now, there's no law that says that. We've done it by agreement, okay? Now, we do have a written document that's an MOU where we've all signed on to that, to sort of agree to that. But that's very different than everybody comes to the table and just tells everybody what they've been doing, right? And informs them what they've been doing. So part of it is because our general understanding is that anything one of us do affects the others, right? So there is a ripple effect, right, on everyone else. So a dilute, So those are some of the core things that we keep doing. The other thing is that we have a, still a really strong shared understanding about what the causes of violence against women and girls are. So there, we spent a lot of time on that. Most integrated responses are not doing very well because they don't see the problem and, and the solution is the same. So you often see arguments about the solution because they don't see the cause as the same. We worked really hard for us all to see the cause of it as the same, so that if you took 10 cases of domestic violence in Duluth today, we'd all be able to name them real quickly because we see all the different types of cases, right? And so we spent a lot of time on that in terms of thinking about this. So those are the things that were established way back when that we're um, still doing. So what are the things that we tried that did not work? Um, anger management was one. We did anger management with perpetrators uh, way back when. and we um, realized very quickly that the men were experiencing a lot of anger in a lot of other places in their lives and not using violence towards, and that they really you know, used their violence and had a particular thinking when they stepped into their house or with their family members, right, in discussion or relation, that that place in particular they felt really entitled to use violence. So we stopped doing anger management. We also have stopped following the money. So one of the biggest mistakes we made in Duluth is that 
We developed a family justice center without including the voices of survivors first. It was our biggest mistake. So the US government was giving up all the money. So I'm not saying family justice centers don't work. I'm saying we designed ours without the voices of survivors and we learned, right? So we, um, I was talking to Lucy about this because she actually came there around this time, but we have this, it, there's a, a news segment. We had a hair salon in ours. By the way, nobody ever used that hair salon. Not one survivor would have their hair done. would have shrunk her. <laughs> and so um, we had a place for prosecutors to meet and with police to meet, and it wasn't what survivors wanted. So we followed the money, we followed the typical model, what survivors wanted was family law lawyers, civil lawyers. That's what they want. So we got all the cops in the hair salons out. <laughs> and now we have, now we've redesigned it. And uh, it's with lawyers. And we'll, now when we use the term advocates, just so you know, we're not talking about lawyers. For us, it's what you would say practitioners, okay? So if you hear me use that term. So ours is advocates and family law lawyers. So that's ours. The other thing we've seen a lot of places do is that's a mistake, is copy and paste tools from other places. It's a big mistake to do that, is to say, oh, well, what is their risk assessment tool look like? We believe that risk assessments should be based on what does the research say about how women are getting killed or harmed in your community? What does the wording say? What did the survivors give you input about, right? But don't just copy and paste someone else's risk assessment, right? You have no idea if it's valid in your community at all. And so we've seen a lot of places do that. Um, no drop prosecution policies. We had one of those, right, Lori? Um, for a while, do you want to say a little bit um, about that? Yes, uh, we had a no drop prosecution policy that we thought we're going to be tough on crime. Uh, we're going to go ahead and prosecute every single case that's before us, regardless of what our survivors are telling us, regardless of what our uh, advocacy or practitioners are telling us. And surprise, surprise, we were losing all kinds of cases. We had um, uh, cases going to trial where we couldn't even find survivors anymore. And so we had to go back and talk to survivors. What do you need? Uh, and, and when do you need it? And, and what is the response that we need to do? And what does winning a case really look like? And it was not what we thought it would be. Yeah, what does it look like for survivors? Yeah. Yeah, so those are some things we did that did not work. Um, the other things we did is that we treated all domestic violence cases the same. So we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in just a few moments, and Kay and Lori will talk about that in their session a little bit tomorrow. But we realized with domestic violence in particular, not all cases are the same. The other thing is that we were using um, Lenore Walker's um, cycle of violence theory. And so we don't use that anymore. And what a lot of people don't know about that theory in particular is that the power and control wheel was developed because of the cycle of violence theory. So we were applying the cycle of violence theory, which is the tension building phase, like the explosion, and then the honeymoon. So we were doing uh, support groups with survivors, and survivors um, kept saying, I don't have that honeymoon phase. We're like, yes, you do. Just go home and look. <laughs> right? You're being very oppressive. <laughs> that is shock is another problem, right? They're just telling women, just go home and look for your honeymoon. He's got to be nice sometime, right? It's very terrible we did that, right? And women just kept saying, I don't have it. I don't have it. So we stopped being oppressive with women, and we said, OK, we're going to spend the next year with you and just tell us what you do experience, OK? We're not going to impose any theory. Just tell us what you experience. And that's how the power control wheel came to be born, was because it's survivors' voices that are in it. So we took the most common course of controlling tactics, put power control in the middle, and then the physical and sexual violence around the outside of it. And so that's how that sort of really came to be. But what we really want to, and also, if you see any gender neutral power control wheels out there, put them in the shredder or tell someone it's invalid. Mostly because why we just are so committed to it 
is because that was developed from, from survivors' voices. That, that wasn't just a bunch of you know people who said, I think it's this, this is what it looks like. It's literally survivors' voices, okay? So we would kindly ask that um, you're using them or others are, but that it doesn't exist. Now, there are adaptations of the power control wheel, but every adaptation of the power control wheel you see on the Duluth website, we only allow adaptations if groups do focus groups with survivors. Okay, so any adaptation you see um, are, are those sort of valid ones based on that. So what are some things that we've changed? Well, one of the things that we change, particularly when we think about our work with perpetrators, is that talking about the power differential that violence creates and talking through dialogue is way more important than any other sort of handout we might give, exercise we might do. That that's really foundational. So um, a lot of perpetrator programs give out a lot of handouts about a whole bunch of different things. And what we've learned is that it's a problem to take um, things just from the field that don't look at a power differential and then just pop them in a perpetrator program. So we're not saying that the curriculum has to be exactly how it is, but we, what we are saying, if you don't account for the power differential of the problem. So I'll give you an example. I have no idea if this book was popular here, but in the US, the book, The Five Love Languages, have you heard of that book? Oh, yeah, you have. Okay, yeah. So you know The Five Love Languages. For, so I do a lot of observing the perpetrator programs. Um, it's one of my areas of expertise. And I, I'm going, people, all these news groups are using the love languages, right? So here's the problem with that. The analysis and the basis for which that was created, the presumption was there was no power differential. <laughs> Right? It was based on a relationships of equality and there's no fear, right? So what we've just learned is you can't just bring all this other stuff into your perpetrator programs. And we see it all the time. And it's a real problem, right? That a lot of facilitators would do that we would just say, you just can't do that. The other big thing that we've changed is how we think about accountability. So uh, Lori is a prosecutor, Kay is a probation officer. They work, of course, daily on um, accountability of perpetrators, right? So that we were doing really good. But what we had to really work through is how are we accountable to survivors? And then also, let's just say that this table right here is police and this table right here is probation. What we weren't seeing a lot of was accountability within the institutions. So we, we needed to say, how can the police hold the police accountable? How can the, the case, the directors of probation hold the probation officers accountable? And then the last one is, how can we hold each other accountable across institutions? So that's something we had to work through and was a really big commitment to our integrated response, right? So we developed mechanisms. So one of the big things we said is, if I'm an advocate and I'm looking at a police report and I see that they didn't follow their policy, the question is, who do I call, right? Do I call the supervisor? Do I call the unit leader? Do I call the officer who didn't do it? So we, I'm not saying which way you should go. I'm saying you need to figure out how you're going to do it. It's a critical conversation you should have in your integrated response is how do you hold each other accountable across institutions? <laughs> You have to figure that out, and so it's one of the things that we had to work on and really, really change in our work. We also expanded our definition of what collusion means with perpetrators. So we wanted to, because we kept seeing collusion sort of happen, so our sort of definition of collusion with perpetrators is, is that when we're working with any one perpetrator, any group, that it's collusive if we only see the threat they pose, okay? And we don't see their humanity. It's also collusive if we only see their humanity and we don't see the threat they pose. So the best way to work with a perpetrator is to hold both in equal regard, is to see their humanity, right? And beyond just the violence they've created and to see the threat that they pose. Most practitioners, and this is something for you to think about yourself, is which way do you lean? 
most of us have a natural inclination based on being cynical on the work, right? That can carry it very easy. You can only see the threat they pose, right? I totally get that. I've been there, right? I've also been on the side at times where I didn't see enough of the threat they posed to the partner and bought everything they said and didn't challenge them, right? So the best work is when you can see both. And it's part of what we would call also a trauma-informed approach, right? Is to see both the threat they pose and their humanity, okay? So that's kind of how we think about collusion and being trauma-informed. We also see a lot of programs, because of staffing issues, not being able to have male-female co-facilitators. And I'm talking specifically, and want to, of course, acknowledge that not all perpetrators are in heterosexual relationships. But for programs that are working um, with men in heterosexual relationships, having a male-female co-facilitator is really important. And so, because in part what we say is that we model not just what we say, also what we do. And most programs spend way too much time on power, control, and violence, and not enough on equality. And mostly because they don't know what they think about it themselves yet, or what it looks like themselves. Okay? And a way you can also see this is in our field of work. Our field of work really needs to take a look at how we even organize ourselves. How hierarchical are our own institutions? How much co-leadership do we have in our own institutions? Right? So that's why a lot of organizations have moved away from the single leader, because we also want to practice internally also sort of what we talk about. We've also changed, of course, the importance of culturally relevant groups. So people often say, you know, what, what's sort of the best group makeup is any time a perpetrator comes into a group is his culture representative in the space and you get to decide what culture means right and so it's not helpful and doesn't create an open space for perpetrators to talk if the other people in the group are having a very different conversation and the words in which they use the mannerisms that they have isn't one that the perpetrator can relate to so the two examples in Duluth, we have a Native American men's and violence group, and also um, a group for Christian men who batter. We had a whole bunch of evangelical Christian faith-based men who just would totally disregard the facilitators. I mean, I remember when this happened, his, one of the men said to one of the male facilitators, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? And he said, no, actually, it's not Buddha is. He said, well, then you have nothing for me. You have nothing for me. I won't listen to a word you say, right? So we ended up finding out we had enough men where their interpretation of the Bible was a big part of their work, and so we developed a culturally relevant space. The other thing that we learned is that we have to go way beyond training in terms of how we do this work. That we have spent so much time on training and not enough to look at all the different ways in which institutions are organized. So this is a bit of a whole training in and of itself that we do, but what I want to say about this just as an example is that in a lot of institutions, I'm going to just use police, is there any police here? Oh good, we can really talk. <laughs> Don't tell them. It's only recording that you can edit that part. <laughs> Uh, anyway, this is kind of an easy example, right, to use, but is to say, yeah, just as an example, in a lot of police departments, they get a lot of training or a fair amount, okay? Or, you know, some work could be done on some of the PowerPoints are a little troubling, but, you know, for the most part, they're pretty good. Um, uh, they have a fair amount of resources, resources are the issue, and they have the policies. What we see as the biggest problems often when we do an analysis of police response is how they're linked to other institutions and how they're accountable within their institutions, how they're accountable to survivors and other institutions. Those are fundamentally the biggest things. And so what do a lot of people do? They just go train them again. <laughs> and we're saying, we have to look beyond training, right? In all the ways in which workers are organized, and then if you look at any institution, these are the eight driving factors in any person's job in this field that dictate how they do their job. 
so that if we all retired today and you put all new people in these chairs, we would look at the job and how the job's organized. So what we're saying is don't look at the people who are in the job only, look at how the job is organized. And so we've learned that over time because we just kept spending all this time and train them, train them, train them, train them, train them, right? And the, the reality is practitioners can reject what we say. They, and they can, and they do all the time, right? There are people in institutions who won't ever see it the way we do, and we just keep training them. So what we learned, what we can do to raise their level of job is we can organize their work in a way through forms that they have to fill out, questions they have to ask, and whether they're held accountable for those things, what their mission says, and how they're linked to other institutions in order to do the work better. So just a few more things in terms of what's new then in this work is Couple things that are new is um, the blueprint for safety is what's called the Duluth model on steroids. It's a really bad metaphor. I don't know who said that, but <laughs> anyway, um, three cities in the U.S. got funded to look at how do you take a criminal justice response and go to the next level. So Duluth, Memphis, and New Orleans were all chosen for that. So we developed the next level of a, a blueprint for safety in terms of criminal justice. So that's new, you can find that on the Duluth Model website. We also wanted to look at witness intimidation. So we were, in terms of criminal processes, survivors were experiencing tons of intimidation and we weren't looking at it. And the intimidation, the interesting thing about that was from a lot of their own family members and friends, right? And we knew that, but when we sort of really looked at witness intimidation, we sort of found this over and over. So we did a big project on witness intimidation and encouraging a lot of other communities to do that. In terms of perpetrator work, is looking at parenting. So a lot of perpetrator programs, they'll look at what's the father's or the man's impact on the children, whether they're biologically his or not, so whether he's a father figure of some sort, or biological father. And a lot of them also look at how did he co-parent but what we kept hearing from survivors is the other big piece that perpetrators do is they purposefully get in between the mother-child relationship. And people weren't talking about that barely at all. So we did a whole bunch of interviews with um, those who grew up in homes as children, with perpetrators we did focus groups with, and mothers to learn about that and to really um, think about that in terms of the work. Um, so this is the other big thing that and, uh, Lori and uh, Katie are gonna talk about this more tomorrow, but we also knew that all domestic violence is not the same, that there are three types of domestic violence, and we wanted to develop interventions that addressed all three types. So they're gonna talk more tomorrow about how we responded in Blue to resistant violence, which is primarily women's use of violence and resisting the control um, and violence they're experiencing. So they'll be talking a little bit more about this. We also knew that there were some cases that had nothing to do with coercive control and nothing to do with resistance. They were small, right? Our five to seven percent around the world is about what that should be. But the problem is the system was um, you know, responding the same way, and you shouldn't. It's not justice. To, create, to respond to dissimilar cases similarly, right? So we wanted to really think about what are in interventions for each of these three different types. And then we created Turning Points, which is a curriculum um, for women and how we think about that. So just a couple other things then about what's new. We also wanted to look at a coordinated community response, just not the criminal justice system, so these are just a few examples of where these also um, were created. Kay, we'll have Kay to give an example in just a moment about how we thought about it, for example, in juvenile justice response. But we wanted to move beyond criminal justice in terms of coordinating a response in culture. And then lastly, just a few things that are problematic that we're seeing in terms of perpetrated programs and integrated responses. So what we're seeing is an over-reliance on uh, men's behavior change programs to fix a perpetrator, and the rest of the system is really weak on accountability. 
I, see, I have to say Australia, I see this one quite a bit here. I see, I've um, done a lot of observing events behavior change programs in Queensland and Victoria. And I remember one day I just said to the facilitators, I said, I'm feeling like I, there's this anxiousness amongst you to make sure he's changed. I'm like, am I like sensing this right? They said, it is. Because if we don't do it, nobody does. And I said, where do you get that from? So when we feel that ourselves, but we're also told that it's on you, right, to make them change. That's a problem, right? That men have to live in a world in which they experience this, not just in a men's behavior change program where they experience this. So this is a thing that needs to shift in Australia, at least in Queensland and Victoria, for sure, because there's too much weak, system, weak accountability outside of the men's behavior change program. We've also seen this problematic trend of shifting way too far towards the pathologizing of perpetrators, okay? So we are not saying that perpetrators don't have trauma, right? We know that many of them do, they, but what we also have to think about is two things. Is this group process the place to deal with it? That's the first question. The reason why we have groups, right, is because it's culturally and socially supported. That's why we talk about it in the group, right? about where did you get the thinking that says that's okay, right, to do that as a man in a relationship, for example, with a woman, right? And what we've seen is that this over-reliance on looking at traumatic uh, histories of trauma, we're not saying they don't exist, but the first question is, should it be dealt with in the group? And then what we see is then that takes up all the space and there's no work done on the sexist belief thinking at all, right? Or very, very little. The other question is, is that what do, why are we assuming and why is there such a tie that when men have trauma, it relates to violence? We don't see, why don't we see it with women? I mean, women should want to burn this place down if that was the case. And we're not burning this place down, right? And so, you know, Who's experienced, especially you know, with uh, in the U.S., for example, with Native American women survivors, the rate of violence that Native American women experience in the U.S. is beyond any other group of people, and they're not burning the place down, right? They aren't, right? So this this thinking of that this is an automatic tie of the cause of the violence is a real problem. What we are saying is that trauma work is separate work. So lots of men who go through our group, then should go, right? But we've taken the position in our therapists have said, do not go order men in therapy. Our therapists have actually said, it's unethical for you to do it, and we won't participate in it. Right, so that's the other thing, you have to find therapists who are willing to take you. Well, some people will, right? But this is a huge issue in this work. And we also see lots of live, <coughs> are our perpetrated programs and curriculum that are not tied to the lived experience of victims. There are curriculum going around. If you looked at the curriculum, you would not, if a survivor read it, they'd be like, uh, whose life is this talking about? Because it's not mine. You don't even see the words victim or domestic violence in some of them, right? So that's a real problem in terms of how this um, is done. And then just for the integrated responses, that we've seen that are really sort of problematic. We talked a little about uh, being disconnected with advocates, not having the core leaders, no connection to the um, survivors' voices. But lastly, we also see in a lot of integrated responses, when they do take the time to hear from survivors, they dismiss what survivors say. They'll say like, oh, no, well, that was just those 10 survivors you talked to. We said no. But what we're not doing, this isn't about an outcome-based look. This is about survivors are looking at your response and saying, this is a problem for how you've designed it, right? So that's very different than an outcome evaluation, right? About what did you do and what did it produce? These are survivors that are saying, if you really want to help me, this is what should be happening. So that's a really big problem in terms of um, what we're seeing. Then um, I'm just going to move then to this um, last one here. 
about problems is that there's a lack of focus about looking at the unintended consequences and particularly our mar marginalized communities. And so this is a huge issue. We found this, and you know, the US rightly so gets criticized for its prison population, its over-criminalization, right? And so this is something we, we could have anticipated, right? But there were very few discussions about the unintended consequences of any sort of efforts that we made. The other big thing we see is um, the over-professionalization of programs. So we've seen many more um, that, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, that really rely on the degrees of the practitioners as opposed to their lived experience. And we would say that's a really big problem. And then lastly, not enough community members who are part of it. And so we are seeing things that are encouraging, um, of course, and you know, this is all good. We are seeing more leadership by victims in the work, more use of technology to reach out in terms of communities. We've had a whole COVID experience, of course, together. So that's a, a really good response. And then also just to say that we can't, for our researcher friends in the room, we love you, but we can't wait for you to research it in order to do it. <laughs> Right? In too many communities, we'll say, we, we don't know, we don't have the research to say. We would say, what we want to do, right, is have data, have research, and our experience, right? That's the best sort of response, but we can't wait for research in order to try some things, okay? So that there are ways, but if we include the voices of survivors more, we know we're going to be more sort of on the right track, okay? We also know that there's more intersectionality looking at our work. Examples, housing, I know housing is a huge thing. We recently did some focus groups with survivors in a, it was a different country. They wanted to add more shelters. And we said, we said, well, let's do a focus group with survivors and say, what do they want for housing? Not one of them said a shelter. Not one. They all said they wanted their own independent living. But the government wanted to move towards more shelter beds. And often what we'll see is that efficiency will override what survivors want. And I get the cost of it, but it wasn't what survivors want. And that we also really want to look at not just, um, uh, so we use this metaphor in the US, you know the Wizard of Oz movie, like the Yellow Brick Road, right? So we say, in, with practitioners, we can't just spend our time on another woman comes in the door, we take her down the Yellow Brick Road. Another woman comes in the door, we take her down the yellow brick road, right? We also, part of our work is to change the course of the yellow brick road. And that's systemic advocacy. So we need to shift in terms of our practitioners, not to just have time to work with every woman who comes in the door, but also to give them time to work on the systemic issues. Okay? So, Kay, we, I want you to just share the example of the, the juvenile justice. That would be great if you could just share about that. All right. Um, well, because part of my responsibility included a juvenile detention facility in Duluth, and we were a part of the uh, integrated response, one of the things that the integrated response advocated for early on was a mandatory arrest policy. So all of uh, law enforcement in our area have agreed to that. And if they go to respond to a domestic violence scene and there is any sign of, of physical harm, they are required to arrest. What we started to see is they were very well trained in that area. And they were using that policy now to respond to family violence, which was typically between an adolescent boy and either a father, a boyfriend, or a stepfather, and they were believing that they had a mandatory arrest policy that applied and arresting that juvenile. So the numbers went way up at the juvenile center of these young men coming through the door. And I was concerned that that was not the intent of the policy. It was intended um, to arrest those in, involved in violence with an intimate partner. And certainly that parental-child sort of uh, relationship didn't fit the criteria. 
So I knew that in the agreement, in order to make any changes, we go back to our integrated response team. And I called um, the co-facilitator in that, and he agreed to take a look at that uh, data. He came to look at all of our files of the intakes that we had done on these young men. He interviewed the young men. He cross-checked who they, uh, the victim of those assaults was, were in the home, and he contacted the uh, chief of police in Duluth. These were primarily Duluth arrests. And through that process, what they agreed to was that it may have been um, misapplied, that policy. It cast the net way too wide, and so law enforcement changed their procedure just to add a couple of extra steps, which they were already doing in intimate partner violence. So what we asked is, when you come to the scene of these sorts of situations, apply the predominant aggressor um, and the self-defense questions. And they agreed to do that. They were already trained in that area. They, they just weren't using it in the response to uh, the, the juvenile males being the uh, perpetrators. And the number of those young people coming in was greatly reduced. So it worked. It, it, it sort of was a, a, one of the system partners calling to the attention of the police uh, an issue that we saw and we were hoping we could address through the process, um, it got addressed. I think one of the things, okay, you didn't share this each, so this is Victoria. Tell them though what your first response was. Oh, what did you do? well, <laughs> my mother was all Italian, <laughs> so that explains this. Um, I just wanted to call the chief of police and say, stop this. Quit bringing these kids up here. We're trying not to lock everybody up, and your officers are bringing all these kids, so just knock it off and this will be fine. Um, I have the uh, the co-facilitator of the CCR said, ah, you might want to rethink that. <laughs> you know, hit, hit the pause button and let the process work. Um, and it did. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna have Lori just share just a little reflection, but one of the things we are, we are gonna still have break um, at 11, and then we're gonna come back before we move to the next session and just answer some questions and thoughts and reflections about everything we just shared. But, Lori, just some reflections over your years in this and sort of how you've seen things change and improve and, and get better or worse, that sort of thing. Oh, absolutely. I, I think about um, when we first began our integrated response in the community that, that I reside in and that I was prosecuting. Um, I, you know, I think about uh, how we were thinking about violence, how we were thinking about uh, what needed to happen. Um, we were not connected with um, our advocacy or our practitioner programs, we were certainly uh, not connected with the survivors' voices at all. And, and uh, we were very much thinking that, you know, an incident comes in, we're going to look specifically at this incident, we're going to see if the facts, uh, how they integrate with the law, and we're going to move those cases and, and, and move that case down the yellow brick road. Um, and, and very much thinking that, um, that that was justice at that point in time. And you know, we learned very quickly when we began our integrated response that uh, the, what, what survivors were telling us, what they needed and when they needed it was really critical to, to making sure that justice is served in these cases. And then also um, on the three types of violence, you know, the, the idea that resistive violence should be treated differently, and uh, women and, and juveniles that use violence, how do we look at that? And so once we really began to honor the voices of survivors, and then within the particular communities that we were serving, um, you know, what do our indigenous survivors say about their lived experience. It was really um, a profound impact, and some of the impacts were immediate. Some of the responses were immediate. Some took a little bit more time, but that was very interesting to see.